All right, so we're back on the Seinfeld debate. We're back with Sean Graybill. And so Sean and I have been discussing the merits of the Seinfeld versus the Office, and I will always be a diehard Office fan. And Sean, sadly, will always be a diehard Seinfeld fan. Might send him the purgatory, but it's up to God. <laughs> so. See, I'd almost, I'm inclined to say that's worth it, but that might be a little heretical, so uh, I'll, re I'll refrain this time. I think I crossed heresy when I combined Catholicism with predestination there. Something but, like that. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so the sitcom, so Seinfeld and Office are both sitcoms, and sitcoms, um, as I was doing my research, it turns out that I Love Lucy was the first sitcom, and that was back in 1950 with Lucille Ball. Um, and so I'm supposed to rally up the feminists here and say that we need to we need to start staking claim where we have a claim of that we had the first sitcom, but sitcoms are really an American thing and Americans love their sitcoms, and so situational comedies kind of took off because they're kind of pointless and because they're very relatable. So maybe that's a good jumping off point for Sean to talk about Seinfeld here. Definitely, I think one of Seinfeld's strongest qualities is just how relatable it is. And the funny thing about it is that it's relatable in the mundane, basically. It takes a look at everyday life situations that uh, people can understand, that they can uh, watch the, uh, the, each episode and pick out different scenarios and different events that the characters go through and see their own frustrations uh, with life or their own difficulties that they have, like being stuck in a Chinese restaurant and having to wait uh, hours and hours to get a table, or like not knowing where to find your car in a parking garage. Like <laughs> some of these mundane routine activities that you know can kind of be frustrating, you know, day to day. And who would have thought to put them on TV? Like I don't know. I don't. I don't know if anyone would want to put like my daily routine on TV. Like, well, shoot, I ran out of toothpaste this morning. Well, there you go. That's a Seinfeld episode. <laughs> Um, and somehow Jerry Seinfeld and Larry David found a way to make that entertaining. So what I think that kind of comes down to here, uh, I'm going to string a bunch of really long words together in a row and then we'll break them down what they mean. So some people say that Seinfeld is escapist fiction for a society that is uncomfortable with its own high standards of order and civility. Okay, so Sean's trying to relate philosophy to sitcoms. I, I feel like we're getting too deep into Seinfeld, but continue. <laughs> sure, yeah, so we'll, we'll bring it back a little bit. We'll come back from the edge of uh, philosophy and uh, <laughs> make this day-to-day uh, -day again. So what's this idea of escapist fiction? Well, it kind of comes back to what sitcoms are uh, for all kinds of sitcoms. So it's how do we enjoy our entertainment? How do we relate to the world around us? Uh, and how do we understand that? in the shows that we produce and then in the shows that we support. So there are a lot of things that we struggle with in life that are difficult, that aren't fun. But when we watch other people go through it and see how they react, we do a couple things. We can relate to them as characters and as people. We can sometimes learn new things, although learning might not always be the primary motivator uh, of a show or sitcom. But in walking through these characters that have struggles similar to us, uh, we kind of feel like we're not alone in what we go through. So that's kind of that escapist fiction kind of idea. And then the second half of that is being uncomfortable with uh, the high standards of order and civility. So that kind of comes to the idea of like, in our society, we've established like ways and routines of how we think it's best to do things. You say hi to your neighbor when you're walking your dog. Uh, you make sure to leave your porch light on at night because it's the right thing to do. But some of these things, when we break them down, they start to seem kind of silly. Like, why do we do the things we do? Why do we pay people to stand in front of doors and only let certain people in as uh, doorkeepers or bellhops or whatever their job may be? So in watching Seinfeld, we see our four main characters, Jerry, George, Elaine, and Kramer, kind of play with the boundaries of what's normal or what's expected in society. <laughs> I'm laughing at Chef because he used the word normal and Seinfeld in the same sentence here. <laughs> <laughs> I think the key operative in that is uh, how Seinfeld plays with the normal. So uh, they definitely don't treat the normal as normal. Um, I think each of the characters is kind of used as, as a window to look at each of these different perspectives. So you have George, who's you know, the classic narcissist, always looking for what can I get out of me from this. 
Um, and you have Aline, who's uh, you can be kind of e egomaniac at uh, egomaniacal at times, and also has this drive that we've seen here, this pursuit um, of wanting to to advance in life, to get a better position at her job. Uh, we see uh, Kramer, uh, who in many situations uh, wants the best in situations, but it has completely unorthodox ways of going about accomplishing uh, those ends. <laughs> And then, of course, we have Jerry, who kind of acts as the interpreter, in a sense, for his friends uh, and the audience at home. Okay, so Jerry's kind of a mediator for all of it. Like, when I was doing research for this, I found a picture of Jerry Seinfeld, and I didn't recognize him at all. Hmm. And it's not so much that he's changed, but he just doesn't look the same in any way. It's very interesting. Alright, so you mentioned characters, uh, relating to characters in Seinfeld. But, as we discussed before with Seinfeld, the characters don't evolve any, so are we supposed to be able to relate to them? Is it a fluke that we do? I think the way we relate to characters in Seinfeld is we relate to them through the stories they go through. I know we talked last time about um, Seinfeld's really about the stories rather than character development, so what drives the show isn't necessarily wanting to see how character is going to grow or how they're going to change in their decision making or how they relate to other people but rather it's anticipating how they're going to react to the different situations they find themselves in it's kind of like what are they going to do next um and i think that by poking fun at everyday situations where we wouldn't feel comfortable doing something that they might do uh it kind of gives us room to breathe whereas we couldn't uh, it would be socially unacceptable to park in a handicapped parking spot just to be closer to the mall when you walk in. But of course, the characters in Seinfeld, uh, led by Kramer's uh, kind of pleading, demanding uh, at his request, take up this spot. Uh, and you see the natural consequences where the other people who are at the mall, when they realize uh, what's happened, they beat up uh, the uh George's dad's car. <laughs> so then the characters have to deal with this unexpected turn of events. And what do they do? Do they own up to their responsibilities? No! They pretend like it was somebody else in order to try to get out of the situation. So we kind of have an outlet for our own uh, selfishness, for our own, man, I really wish I could behave this way <laughs> in this situation, but if I did, there'd be actual ramifications. I think we see in Seinfeld uh, kind of a release of all the pressure that's built up from following these guidelines that we've stuck with for so long. So that Seinfeld is kind of like our creative outlet for being a little bit more lax with the standards that society wants to put on us. Okay, okay. So, okay. <laughs> And like the, that exact situation that you're like you're talking about, like that exact episode of where like they'll just brush it off into someone else. This thing is the reason I I am so frustrated with Seinfeld, and I'll always be frustrated with Seinfeld. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, ugh. all right. <laughs> so this so because Seinfeld is more situationally based, living up to its real name here. Like, do you think that's what will keep it timeless? I think so. I think in a way, how the characters behave uh, translates to what we see today. So sure, there are a few references that are outdated, like uh, Kramer having 555 Filk instead of film for movie phone, whereas today we just go on Google and kind of search you know, the times of our movies and what movies are playing. So that might be the part that's outdated. But the idea of, you know, having a phone number that's close to someone else, and then you're getting all these calls, and what do you do with those calls? Well, if you're Kramer, you start your own homemade business, and well, are you making any money? Well, no, but you're doing it just because you're Kramer and you get enjoyment out of it. <laughs> so I think we see uh, behaviors and qualities in each of the main characters uh, that translate to today, even through the changes in technology. I think rather than uh, focusing on the time period and era that they were in. One of the masterpieces and the reasons why Seinfeld is such a great show and so iconic is that it, it really explored how people interact with each other and then the situations can be swapped in and out, which in essence is kind of what they did from episode to episode, season to season. And I think that's why people can resonate so well with it today still.
Yeah, definitely. And I, I think that's going to be one similar one similarity between The Office and between Seinfeld mm-hmm. is how their situations are. Like People always say they learn things from The Office or from Seinfeld. So we'll come back and we'll cover that in a little bit. But we're going to take a small break with uh, Local Construction by Reliant K. Construction by Reliant K. An old, old <laughs> song request from Sean. I say it's old because I never grew up on Reliant K. I just knew it existed way back when. See, Reliant K might be old, but in my defense, the album came out in 2016, I believe. So. Oh. Three years? <laughs> I, I could go older. We could go back to like the anatomy of the tongue in cheek if you wanted to. Oh, no, no, oh. it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so I'm going to advocate for The Office here. So The Office came out in 2005. It aired in 2005 and they aired six episodes for their first season because they were mimicking the British, uh, British series. And so they just did six episodes and it dropped for six months. And then it got picked up again. So there was questionable of like whether they would actually ever become a series. But, so, The Office is a little bit revolutionary with its mockumentary style of the whole, like, if you guys don't know what mockumentary is, it's a mock documentary. Mockumentary, right? So, uh, they have the documentary style of the talking heads where they'll, you know, sit one of the characters down and they'll have them do their monologue. Um, and the camera crew is there to learn about the office, a, a typical everyday office and if they just pitch this uh, paper company. And it works very well, and it works really well with creating the characters, like with Michael Scott, because he couldn't be more over the moon about this, that there's someone there videotaping him 24-7. For sure. Yeah, so like this was his dream come true. So it works great with the story, it's not awkward. Like with me, with Modern Family, it seems a little awkward that mm-hmm. they're just following this family, right? right? Yeah, so mockumentaries kind of became more in style after The Office. They, they really hit the niche with it, they did it very well, and so everyone tried to do it after them. All right, and so because of the mockumentary style, it made it more relatable to all ages. Because they were doing the common office place, uh, people were able to, like, from kids in college, they would go, this is what I'm going into with people who just from high school became were like Pam went straight into being a receptionist like they really related to it all the way up but like they all had a boss like Michael Scott um and then like a lot of the office is actually truth it's not fiction mm-hmm. of the first couple episodes um that BJ Novak and oh I can't remember Toby Flinderson's real name shoot but Toby Flinderson, so BJ Novak and Toby Flinderson were both in The Office, or they, they were characters in The Office, but they were also the writers, and so was Moe's. And they all each wrote and at one of the first episodes, what's his name? Paul Lieberstein. That's right, Steen Paul Lieberstein. Yep. I don't think, I don't think this is the funniest thing ever. I, I don't think his Instagram or his Twitter account are officialized with the blue check. Oh. Which makes it so funny to me oh that Toby goodness. is not officialized. <laughs> I feel like Michael Scott has something to do with that, you know, or yeah, either Michael Scott or Steve Carell, they got together. They yeah. probably slip in a few bucks to Twitter and Instagram just not to have <laughs> Toby being official. <laughs> One little dig at Toby, oh, like, absolutely. lasting forever. <laughs> but, okay, so they all wrote uh, one episode in the first season. And so the um, cultural awareness episode, is it the cultural awareness? Or diversity day? Diversity day, yes. that's it. Yep. Diversity day was an actual thing that happened to some to one of the cast members when they used to work in an office. That whole situation verbatim happened wow. in someone's life. <laughs> In a real office place. Oh, man. <laughs> There's so much stuff like that in the office that everyone just looks at it and goes, huh, that just kind of happened to me today. <laughs> yep, yep. And so, like, being how to, like, it kind of goes back to what you're saying about Seinfeld, it's that escapism of looking at it and, like, being able to be on the outside of it and laugh at it. Because, like, being a character within the office, like, if I was Angela, I'd hate that place so much. But, like, looking at it from the outside, it's funny and you like it. Alright, so The Office kind of hit the Knicks with cringe comedy. This was their comedy. Uh, they're very good at situational comedy, which made them a sitcom. And they had a lot of improv, especially with their cold opens, a lot with Jim's pranks for improv. Um, a lot of the uh, conversations between um, Oscar and Angela were improv. Like, they had a lot of improv, which was their situational comedy, but all of the scripted stuff was cringe comedy. 
and they, they nailed it, and they kept going for it until about season five. I don't know, we just won't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> but so everyone always says that what makes The Office timeless and what will keep it around forever is the familiarity they're able to do between the characters and between the audience. Because you are more... Because this is the difference between The Office and Seinfeld. The Office creates a character you can relate with and see them grow. So like with Jim, you, you automatically relate to Jim because he's stuck in a hopeless job. He's pining after a girl he can't have, but you really like Jim because he's a really good guy. He does try to do his work when he's not playing video games. Sure. And he, like, he's kind of living out your fantasy of he's playing pranks on the really annoying guy. And like he gets to play with it, right? Who wouldn't want to be Jim, basically? Exactly! Yep. Who wouldn't want to be Jim? And so you, you just you always automatically relate to Jim. And then you kind of see him grow. In season two, he kind of stepped out of his comfort zone with mm -hmm. Casino Night, right? Yep. And so he like puts himself out on the line there, and it, it just goes plus. <laughs> oh yeah, fails drastically. <laughs> yeah, but like you don't ever see him have any self pity over that. And so he like, he moves on and he goes to Stanford, right? Yep. And so I always love this part in Stanford of why he's called Big Tuna. So there is a line somewhere later in the season that says Jim always brings a ham and cheese sandwich to lunch. This is all Jim eats. This is Jim's very consistent. Mm -hmm. He's a very regular guy. Ham and cheese sandwich all the way. And as soon as he switches to his life, he goes to Stanford. He brings a tuna sandwich. Right exactly. Now. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's those little things yes. that it talks to the human experience. Like, okay, so you made a huge switch that you completely changed the location of your job. And along with that huge switch, we have this human tendency to like make little changes too, like switching yeah. the type of sandwich you have. Sadly, it, it kind of ruined him for the rest of the season because of Andy yep. calling him Big Tuna. But, like, it's a little thing that you don't notice. But, yeah, you're right. It's the little things that, like, he slowly started to change, and then everything goes back to the way it was, and slowly Jim starts to grow up, and he, like, starts taking steps forward, and you see Pam start taking steps mm -hmm. forward, and, like, Jim starts to get that hopefulness back, and he goes and goes to Philly and does all this stuff. And so because the characters grow is what makes it relatable. And... It makes it much more. I feel like it's gonna make it more timeless than Seinfeld. Hmm. That you'll always have those strong characters. You'll always see Michael grow up when he meets Holly. You will always see Jim try to do something different. You will always see Angela kind of soften and like grow. You just see them grow up, and you're like, oh, my babies grew up. <laughs> right. <laughs> like this is how you are when you watch Michael. Like, like my babies grew up. Kind of like Michael's line, you know, in the uh, last episode, the season finale. <laughs> my kids grew up. <laughs> right, yeah. If you guys want to look it up, feel free to look it up. We'll, we'll let you uh, figure that one out. But uh, yeah, Michael has a classic line that's relevant in this situation. But yeah, and that's like one of the great, because it's a very Michael line. Yes. It's something he would have said in season one. Mm-hmm. And he still says it in season nine. Exactly. Like, he grew up, but he's still like... <laughs> right, so, like, even through all these big changes that we're talking about, there are some aspects of his character uh, that still persist. And I think we can relate to that, uh, you know, through all the changes we go through, whether it's uh, through, you know, higher education or through workplace shifts. Uh, there are still those qualities that we retain about ourselves. Yeah. All right, so I kind of touched on this a little earlier. I just want to... Nix this because I feel like this is what's going to beat Seinfeld. <laughs> Ooh, oh, okay, guys, here's the challenge. Uh oh. All right, so the most revolutionary thing about The Office it was is that Michael Shore made sure that it was a mixture of actors and writers throughout the whole thing. That you had Toby Flinderson, Michael Shore was most. You had Toby Flinderson, um, Oscar. No, never mind. I take that back. Oscar wasn't. Um, it was Toby Flinderson, Michael Shore. Uh, who did I say? Oh, I'm um, BJ Novak. BJ Novak, yeah. And Mindy, I can't Kaling? remember her last name. Kaylin? Kaylin? Yeah, yeah, Mindy Kaylin. Uh, we're all writers on the show, and they're all involved in it. And any extras they ever needed, they pulled them from the writing staff to mm. be the extras for that episode. Mm. There was always an interaction between the writing staff and between the actors. And so the writing staff would always go and ask the actor, would Angela say this in this situation? Of just to like, because they knew that the actors were very in tune with their characters. And they were, because of this, like, the writers knew how much improv was happening on set, and so they'd leave room for it. Mm -hmm. So it was the little stuff like that that made it, like, a little bit like that. And so Michael Shore kind of carried that on. Michael Shore also wrote um, The Good Place. Okay. So he kind of carried that on into The Good Place. So, like, see? 
domino effects are happening. Right, <laughs> yep, yep, lasting effects, you know, moving from one uh, medium to another. Right, one. so I think that's going to be my, my biggest stance of why The Office is going to beat Steinfeld. But we'll come back after Ever Be by Aaron Strish. Aaron Schiss, if you guys want more songs like that, if you're in a worship mood tonight, it is Worship in the Garden. It's in the chapel from 7 to 9, and it's going to be all contemporary worship songs. It sounds like a really awesome event. Uh, the guy who's doing it, it's a senior project. I completely forget his name, but he took over the LBC Instagram uh, today, and it looks really interesting, but that just reminded me to do an advertisement plug for him. I'll, I'll name drop them for their benefit. Uh, ben Moeller took over the LBC Instagram. Uh, great guy. And Jesse Graham will be uh, performing some musical stylings. He's actually my RA and another solid guy. So 7 to 9 tonight in the chapel. Come on out and support both of them. There you go. There it is. <laughs> All right. So Sean and I have both thrown the gauntlet for our side. The gloves have been taken off. <laughs> yes. The passion has been exposed. All right. So... They're both, they both try to be comedies. Like, we'll give them that. They're both comedies, mm -hmm. right? They're both revolutionary for their time. For sure. And to be fair to both of us, at least, for all our listeners out there, we're, well, I know I'm a huge fan of both. I'll let Morgan talk about <laughs> how much she does or doesn't tolerate Seinfeld. But I, I have immense, I have immense love for both shows, honestly. Seinfeld, number one, but great love for The Office as well. Yeah, see, I just, I put the office at the number one. I, I just can't get past, I don't know. I, I can't perfectly phrase what part of Seinfeld I can't get past, but to be fair, to be fair, I'll give you some credit. You have changed my mind a little bit, but it's still not the top ten. Well, th that's some grit. Again, this is uh, experience number two of uh, seven witnessing events, so <laughs> if it's anything like uh, speaking the message of Christ, well then we got at least five more to go, so. Slow wins, but shit. Exactly, exactly, yeah. These are the important things you need to know before right. you go into the workforce. Bringing theology <laughs> into Seinfeld in the office. Because, I mean, what better thing is there to do, if we're going to be honest? Uh, I feel like this might be a great, like, ministry tool that LBC could be teaching. Like, what, what TV show do you watch the most? What biblical experience can you pull out right? and smack your coworkers <laughs> with? <laughs> right, something like that. So, uh, LBC students, you hear it here first. Morgan and I will co-teach... <laughs> Uh, um, a class on integrated theology with modern pop culture hits from the 90s and on. That's fake, but we wish we were co-teaching that. LBC Registrar, hit us up, please. We'd love to get in contact with you. Dr. Freeman, just, just so you know, we really want to do this. Yep. Let us know, Dr. Freeman. We're available. It's a little bit like Christian and culture that Dr. Mega teaches, but slightly better because we're relevant. <laughs> See, no no shade to Dr. Mango, uh, honestly, uh, great guy. So, we'll say equally awesome. We'll go yes. with that. No. no Just, I, I, okay, I, I would agree with this, that the majority of the way I do analyze shows is from what I learned in that class. Like, mm -hmm. and the way I was analyzing The Office, like, that's, uh, Dr. Mango's culture and Christianity is what made me love The Office. Really? So, there we go. Okay, yeah. fun fact for you guys. There you go. So Dr. Like, Manga has changed in the world. Let's a little bit of insight. That's, that's right. And honestly, that's, sometimes that's the best you can hope for. There so. you go. <laughs> All right. So, <clears throat> the office is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I don't disagree. <laughs> uh, but I will say this. I believe that Seinfeld set the foundation for The Office to be what it is today, and here's why oh, I believe he's that. He's going below. I, All right. Well, kind of. <laughs> if you want to talk geogra or yeah, ge geology technically is below, but um, what Seinfeld did, it was one of the first comedies that told people that it's okay for the characters to not be good people, because when you break it down, Jerry, George, Kramer, and Elaine. They're not really good people. Like we talked no. about wanting to park in a handicapped spot and George shoving women and children <laughs> out of the way to escape a burning building. So yes. they're not, yeah, well, multiple occasions. <laughs> so they're not good people. But somehow we still are able to laugh at that and we're able to poke fun at that and apply that to our own lives and get entertainment from that comedy value. And I feel like because of that foundation that Seinfeld laid, we can appreciate character. We can appreciate the development of characters like Michael Scott better. Because if you go go back and watch season one of The Office, it is hard to like Michael. Like 
I'm not even gonna lie, it's it's difficult. And part of that comes out in, in humor and comedy, and that's part of why it's funny, because he's a character that's pretty unlikable. But because he starts from such a bad place, to watch his personal growth through the seasons is so much more rewarding. Yeah. Yeah. Here, I'll, I'll give you a point. Uh, okay, so the reason season one is so different and so bad to watch is because they modeled it exactly after the British, mm -hmm. right? And so in Britain, they don't mind that their boss is terrible and doesn't do any work. Like, the <laughs> audience doesn't mind that. Sure. And they kind of figured that out in America. People really mind that, even it, in a TV show. Like, yeah. people are really frustrated with that. <laughs> And so like, I'll, I'll give you the point because uh, the, I think this is a sad part of The Office is that it changes at least three times. Mm. Uh, once with season one where they change Michael Scott, like they change his whole wardrobe to whole character. Sure. He's completely different. And then in season five when they get rid of Michael, it kind of changes the show. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it, it kind of has the ups and downs of like you're able to say you like the later part of The Office or you're able to say you like the early part of The Office. So Definitely. like there's two different subcultures within The Office because of that. Yep. Which is kind of sad, but like, that's yeah. just how it is, so that's fine. So Seinfeld remains pretty consistent because they don't do that character at all. Very consistent, because the thing that's changing isn't the characters, either for better or for worse, but rather the situations in which they find themselves. So, I mean, maybe you could even rank the situations like from, from good to neutral to bad, and kind of evaluate Seinfeld episodes from that dynamic, like, how do the characters respond when something good happens? How do they respond when something bad happens? So I think trying to approach the characters themselves in Seinfeld, you can't evaluate their growth, but maybe looking at the events and making them that way uh, can help people who struggle to evaluate Seinfeld. Okay. I feel like there's some complacency. Complacency? Complacency? Complacency, sure. Complacency. That comes from Seinfeld. Because it, it kind of like teaches the culture that like this like you can be annoying and not able to communicate with your same sex like Elaine like it kind of like promotes that. I'm not sure if it promotes it as much as it's almost like a satire within the show. <laughs> so the show itself, I, I'm hesitant to call it a satire completely, yeah. but I think there are very large elements of satire that go in there. So we see the over-exaggerations of Elaine <laughs> claiming to hate all women it's just to show the extent of her character. And then in our own lives we can see, oh, I know someone who I work with that's like that, even though in all likelihood they don't hate every other woman yeah. out there like Elaine may or may not try to portray. So I think by poking fun at it, it, sh it backs away from uh, teaching or promoting uh, that kind of lifestyle. I think we also see that in how the non-major characters react to some of the major characters, like uh, the angry mob at the mall uh, beating up uh, George's dad's car. Um, or we see, well especially in the finale, when all these minor characters come back and testify against all the things that the four main characters did. I think that might be the biggest response to this idea that of almost wondering if Seinfeld's promoting this kind of culture that we see these natural consequences and then the end of the whole se uh, the whole show is that they end up in jail. <laughs> so kind of that, going back to that no hugs, no learning type of idea, their repeated bad behavior, I guess you could call it, throughout the seasons got them in jail and that kind of goes back to the natural consequences of life. <laughs> okay. Alright, so, okay, we kind of covered that, like, Seinfeld, this timeless because it's situational. And I would say that The Office timeless is because you get to relate to the characters, right? Definitely. Okay, so, um, comedy-wise, <laughs> I'm kind of digging myself into a hole here because I don't like cringe comedy. <laughs> Uh-oh. But comedy-wise, like, okay, make your, make your case for why Seinfeld would be better comedy-wise. Sure. So I think Seinfeld was more revolutionary in terms of comedy because if you think about what kind of sitcoms were prevalent and what was very popular during that time, like think back to like the ideas like Full House, um, that kind of like feel good uh, type of show or The Cosby Show uh, where there are lessons to be learned, where you see the characters go through this I almost want to say isolated incident within an episode where uh, everything's good, there's a problem, they have to work through the problem, and at the end, 
uh, the dad or father figure sits the kids down and talks through the problem, almost translating for the audience. Well, in Seinfeld, you don't really have that at all. So it completely flipped the idea of what a sitcom uh, could be on its head and said, we're not going to try to necessarily teach you a lesson. Rather, we're going to give you something that you can see yourself in or you can see your own life in. And you can almost live vicariously through these characters, witness the bad decisions they make, and get, get entertainment out of that and out of um, kind of walking alongside them in these everyday situations. Okay, I'll give you that. That, that was, yeah, now that, like, uh, as I'm thinking through it, yeah, that's pretty, that is very different from Seinfeld to do, and it did carry on to Friends, mm -hmm. which I'm sure carried it on to many other things. Okay, so, so for Seinfeld's comedy, they're much more situational, right? And they kind of carry in that comedy style the same way that Cosby did. Like, Cosby did a, a revolutionary thing because mm -hmm. he was a comedian, he had his own, but he stuck in his material like Seinfeld kind sure. of did. Alright, but I would say, I would say that, that The Office is revolutionary with its comedy as well. Because it was a mixture of slapstick, um, situational, and it got America to like cringe humor. Mm -hmm, for sure. I, I, like, cringe humor is very hard to describe and to relate, but it's, it's Michael Scott yelling at the Indian girl going, okay, okay, like, right, <laughs> yeah, pushing those boundaries of where at home you're so uncomfortable, like, oh my goodness, I would freeze in this situation, yeah. I wouldn't know what to do, and the phrase that came to my mind as we were talking about cringe humor is that the office was extremely comfortable being uncomfortable. This is true. They were very willing for, uh, to Michael, for Michael to say something he thought was deeply profound and then to pan across the room and it's dead silence. <laughs> and at home, you're sitting there watching and waiting like, oh my goodness, no one's saying anything. What's going to happen next? And as you kind of start to get in that rhythm of the office, you start to laugh during the situations where you know Michael is going to put his foot directly in his mouth mm -hmm. and there's going to be no reaction from anyone else yeah. in the room. And I, I think that's what makes it relatable of that part of cringe humor of because most of the cringe humor is from Michael Scott mm -hmm. because it's from the boss that's what makes it relatable to everyone and I think that's how they got America to like cringe humor was that they kind of took people out of their ter like their mundane office situations mm -hmm. and had them watch it and have them look at it from a different perspective and be able to laugh at it and kind of laugh at their boss as they're laughing at Michael Scott. Like, so like the office kind of like plugged it in there, and they got America to like cringe humor. I can't think of another sitcom that does cringe humor. Like I don't think Brooklyn Nine Nine does it. They're more slapstick, and they're satirical mm -hmm. a little bit. Well, I wouldn't say satirical. Uh, sarcastic. What do I mean? Right, sarcastic, sarcastic, social commentary kind of idea. Yeah, and let's see, Friends wasn't very cringe. Except like, with Ross. I will. I will argue. <laughs> I'll argue that Ross has a big component in cringe uh, he comedy. does he does i would agree with that i i don't like ross out of out of i always say ross is a butt as i watch as i watch the episode it's you're, all I ever you're say. not wrong and to uh david schwimmer's credit he is definitely one of the most talented actors on that show to be able to play someone so well that you dislike so much <laughs> and Almost like he, David Schwimmer makes you care about Ross despite how much you no. dislike him. No. No. Okay. <laughs> Maybe not everyone cares, but the fact remains. I'm pretty cold hearted. <laughs> right. David Schwimmer is a really good guy, and he portrays a really unlikable guy super well. <laughs> All right. So the office kind of hit the niche with cringe humor. Uh, I'm trying to think what other sitcoms came after. Like we have so many sitcoms today. Like with, um, you know, Modern Family, yeah. uh, the Goldbergs. Um, Goldbergs kind of cringe. A little bit. I, I feel like their cringe is more uh, rooted in the fact that it's uh, retro. Smothering. Yeah, it's smothering <laughs> for sure. Um, but like this idea of like hearkening back to an older age. Yeah. So I think that I want to say that the cringe comes from the time differential. Yeah. Although. There are aspects of family and family life that still relate to today, and I think that's how they bridge that gap between, yeah, we're doing a show that's from the 70s, yeah. but we're still going connected to today. Yeah. Last Man Standing is very direct. Yes. Uh, kind of going back to like that Bill Cosby type yeah. idea. 
Yeah. Yeah. Home improvement was very... It was still that family, but it didn't have the recaption afterwards. But it was still, like, that predictable family sitcom that happened before Seinfeld. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know, I think, I think Office may just have the niche on cringe humor. It really does. It's When it comes to top spot, it's number one, without <laughs> doubt, in my mind. Though, I did think of one example, though. I think the Big Bang Theory tried to oh. do that, especially with Sheldon. Yeah. Now, I like I liked the Big Bang Theory. I know a lot of people yes, might yeah, be embarrassed. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I think people might be embarrassed to say that. I'll preface it by saying that the first half of the seasons were far better. I think yeah. towards the second half, it developed more into, well, kind of like character development, where is it going to go? But how the Big Bang Theory tried to integrate cringe humor with Sheldon, I think they almost ruined it, and I'm, I'd have to go back and look if it's laugh tracks or in front of a live audience, but that's, that's what I was thinking. But they don't let, they don't let the cringiness rest like The Office did. The office was very willing to just have a blank shot with with you know just the background noise of the office and yeah. nothing else yeah. during a cringy moment. But I feel like the Big Bang Theory feels like it almost has to respond to the cringiness either with a sarcastic quote from Howard or something <laughs> indignant from Leonard or kind of filling it or with an eye roll from Penny or filling it with laughter. Where I think that if they would have learned more from the office they might have been able to to rest in the uh, discomfort. Yeah. Yeah, and like now that I like think about it some more, some of the better sitcoms don't have laugh tracks. Mm-hmm. And that is like when I was researching sitcoms, that's kind of the biggest thing that evolved in sitcoms was the laugh tracks. Of the cornier the sitcom, the more laugh tracks it had. Right. And like shows like Modern Family, The Office, like Seinfeld doesn't have laugh tracks. Like I, I, I remember hearing laughter, but that's during during like his comedy. Yeah, live. Well, but, yeah, live studio audience for some of the, yeah. the scenes. Uh, like for um, like the Goldbergs, just they don't have the laugh tracks. They mm-hmm. they really let you submerge yourself into it. But I think during like the early two thousand, like the later two thousands, the two thousand tens era, they try to make sitcoms in a different realm of understanding by inserting the, ra- ra- the laugh track. So like with Melissa and Joey. Like, I love Melissa and Joey. <laughs> you have any idea what I'm talking about? It sounds familiar. <laughs> I-, I feel like I saw it on a TV guide late one night at like <laughs> one in the morning one time. So, but so, like, go- keep with, going. Okay, so like with Melissa and Joey, Melissa is like a, a state congresswoman or something and she has a male nanny that takes care of her uh, nieces and nephews because her sister died and so it's, it's that situation mm-hmm. you're given this obscure situation but like they kind of made it corny with the laugh tracks right so maybe maybe getting rid of the laugh tracks that comes is the way to go <laughs> possibly and i i want to say that it's it's a lot harder to have substantial writing that holds up without the inclusivity of a laugh track and i think that's part of what makes shows like the office uh and seinfeld so impressive that the comedy is genuine and well written and i think that many many sins might be able to be hidden <laughs> beneath the guise of a laugh track yeah pretty sure because like sitcoms are putting it in because some psychological study came out of like when you hear other people laughing you laugh mm-hmm. and like they kind of shamed us for it with the laugh track sure like because like everyone started saying that the big bang theory was a terrible show because it was forcing you to laugh like, so they, like, shamed you with the loud tracks. Right. So like, yeah, fine. Whatever. <laughs> and there's something about the human nature where we kind of want to push back a little bit. Like, oh, you're telling me I should be yeah. laughing? Well, then I'm not going to laugh just to show you. Yeah. So. Yeah. It, it helped them as much as it hurt them. For sure. All right. Do we have any other argument? I, I feel like The Office is going to come out with <laughs> And, of course, I'm always going to argue that Seinfeld's on top. I'm going to argue it's at the foundation, and I think I have the upper hand uh, chronologically, just because it was made first. Okay, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you a foundation for setup, because it, change, it changed it from the family dynamic, but I, I would say that The Office introduced a cringe that will forever help the culture. Sure, and I'm totally fine saying that, that Seinfeld and The Office are very different shows. The Office is the best mockumentary that I've ever seen, and <laughs> Seinfeld is the best narcissistic <laughs> escapism fiction uh no hugs no learning show i've ever seen and by my lengthier description you can probably guess which one i like a little better <laughs> there you go. all right 
Well, I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. You guys should go check out the music in the garden tonight at 7 o'clock. It's 7 to 9. It's in the chapel. It looks really awesome. All right, so thank you, Sean, for coming and defending Seinfeld Absolutely. as much as you tried. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I succeeded a little. <laughs> Maybe just a little bit, but the office will win the war. It's okay. All right, so that is the end of my hour. Uh, so up next is Reason by Unspoken.